So in the last episode, I talked about meditation, about the phosphines, and how to raise your serotonin levels. And now you might be thinking this series has gone a little bit off track getting into meditation and stuff like that, but really it hasn't. Where I'm going with all of this is something which I find very interesting and I'm pretty sure that you will find helpful. Um, and that's that once you realize that we really are going extinct, the last human left alive will go extinct sometime in the near future and in the very near future. So if you look at, say, the, the blogs of the Arctic scientists, they have a little survey and it comes out and says, really the bunch, the, the bunch of consensus is around an ice-free Arctic before 2050 or rather before 2025. So if that's true, things really are running away from us. And I think it's reasonable, no one can say when the last human is going to go extinct. But I think you'd be foolish to say it was any time after about 2050. And there's nothing we can do about it, absolutely nothing. So once you come to that realization, then there are a lot of interesting questions to be asked. And I kind of want people to hurry up and get to realism and get to doomerism uh, so that we can have a retrospective. We can start to have meaningful conversations and not this kind of mindless terror and fear that we, we're kind of stuck in the stages of panic, denial and fear. Um, and so, yeah, I would like to move things along and anticipating that they will move along and at some point I think we'll have one or two disasters that will really wake people up and, you know, they might be as early as this year. Very soon people with, will catch up with realism. I am thinking that there'll be a couple of catastrophic events, maybe um, a heat wave uh, that causes perhaps a mass die-off in... Um, say a Middle Eastern country or um, in, in a country like Bangladesh or India, um, some, some kind of um, a mass population dying because of uh, really, you know, 100% humidity and temperatures, sustained temperatures over 32 degrees Celsius. We've come close um, and no one's really noticed or, or bothered. Maybe the, there'll be crop failures or, or something like that that'll It'll really challenge people that are climate deniers and everybody will get over the denial phase. I think people will want to have conversations and I don't think there's anybody thinking ahead to, to where we're headed and what people will need in those times. So I'm trying to talk to you as if we just in those times where we realize that the climate denial is, is uh, impossible to deny and human extinction is imminent. So I'm assuming that we're, you know, you're watching that video and you've caught up. Uh, like there are a few people now that have caught up, but um, I'm assuming that if there was a catastrophic event, like, well, the start of catastrophe, like a grid down event for a few days or crop failures in the US and something like that, I'm imagining that it's not quite like the preppers are thinking and they're thinking you're going to be hunkered down in a bunker, you know, shooting off the zombie apocalypse hordes coming towards your little turf. You'll have time on your hands. You'll have time to watch the sunset. And perhaps your kids are going to ask you, is human extinction something that can't be avoided? Was it inevitable? Is human extinction just something that's built into the equation. Now, I think that it was avoidable. It's not avoidable now, it's too late. The uh, horse has already bolted. But knowing the alien cortex and knowing how the way intellectuals think, I think that uh, 
the consensus will be that it's unavoidable. There's a kind of predestiny in it. That, and it's a kind of a conceit and it lets the alien cortex off the hook, which is really good at getting itself off the hook if it's as good as, at anything. Um, so I think that, no, there is blame to go around. Um, and the blame is because of restraints, is people willingly sacrifice the future of our species for short-term gain. Is it unavoidable? So is it just that competition makes a species evolve, eventually they evolve intelligence, and then that intelligence uh, makes them into engineers and they engineer the planet into the ground um, and annihilate themselves as we seem to be on a trajectory to do sometime in the near term. If you grant me the hypothesis of an alien cortex, you just say the, the thing that's making us go extinct is our reason, our intellect, basically the, the fact that we're clever. We're cleverer than a chimp who is our closest cousin. We're cleverer than a chimp. So whatever bits are different between us and a chimp, in neurologically speaking, you just call out the alien cortex. And then it gives you all the things that we are really sophisticated at, like language. Um, we have a, an obsession with geometric figures that chimps don't have. Um, the square is something we absolutely adore. Just look out of an aircraft and, you know, out of the aircraft window and look at, look at the landscape below you. You can see all these plowed fields and they really all square. So I would call it agriculture. I would call square field agriculture as, as opposed to say, uh, you know, uh, hunter-gatherers had gardens um, and they, you know, primitive people still do have the equivalent of gardens. So I think hominids knew how to farm uh, since time immemorial. Farming's not a new invention. Square field farming is new. Uh, square field farming means that you, you plot out a square, you're literally raping the soil by plowing it. You're sending the ecosystem into shock so it will actually produce um, crops artificially. Uh, so that's something terribly new and nothing like a forest garden, which um, probably I'm surprised even some hominids, um, well, other hominids and maybe even primates um, might, might have. So when we start doing square field farming, um, yeah, then you can really see we are on the fast track to civilization and on to doom. And if you say that all of that is just your alien cortex, then, uh, then you're with me on this theory. And then that's a way of answering this question, whether it's manifest destiny, unavoidable that any species uh, that gets to be as intelligent as us uh, will go extinct. It's a maladaptation. It's something we evolved and it's maladaptive because it means that it gives, um, it, it really helps preserve life in the short term, but it's catastrophic in the long term. So it helps our short term survival, but our long term survival is the price we pay for, for having an alien cortex. The thing about the alien cortex is it's clever. That's the singular thing that differentiates us from apes. We're clever. We're not wise. So in fact, the opposite. So clever means that you, you have the, it's very clever if you can create an atomic bomb. Wisdom dictates that you don't. And that's the difference. So wisdom means that you're clever enough to restrain your cleverness. And that's what's dooming us, that, uh, is that we're not clever enough to restrain our cleverness. It's a kind of a conceit that the alien cortex has, a kind of a narcissism. So it thinks cleverness is good. Now it's a real tall order. Wisdom is a really tall order because to restrain your cleverness in favor of the long-term of objective of survival is, uh, is, is very, it's a very big ask. Now think about it. It, it demands things like, say, things that you take for universal good, say you know, healthcare, everybody loves healthcare. But imagine if you were really wise, 
healthcare has increased the human population to an extent that the planet can't support it. The planet can't support the human population as it is and it's still growing. And healthcare is to blame to a large extent. Take something else, uh, sanitation and hygiene, running water. All of those have made the population blossom. And that blossoming is led to overpopulation and that overpopulation will make our species go extinct. So, if you're really wise, wise enough to restrain your cleverness, you have to be wise enough to not have health care. Can you imagine how difficult that is for the average person? Because the alien cortex is designed to be selfish. It's designed for self-preservation. It seems to be evolved for that. So for your short-term self-preservation, would you give up health care if it meant that our species could survive? Because I think that's really what you'd have to do. You'd have to be wise enough to say, I know that modern medicine could save me, but I and everybody else will choose to forego modern medicine, um, just take our chances with Mother Nature and keep ourselves, allow her to keep our numbers in check. That's how wise you would have to be to survive. Um, you would have to give up this idea that we need to combat disease, that we're in a war against nature, we're in a war against disease. You have to say that, no, disease is our ally. Disease is keeping our species alive long term by killing off the individual members short term. Now, I bet you that most people today would say, yeah, if I'm in need of medical attention, call the freaking ambulance. I screw all the future generations. And that's why we're going extinct. So that short-term attitude of our alien cortex to demand um, life for itself, for the, its individual ego, and screw the future generations, uh, you can see that that's the short-term cleverness that is sweeping aside the wisdom that would just say, yeah, I'll allow myself to be sacrificed so that we can continue ad infinitum. And I think you will agree that there is a module in our brains that has become like this. You can't imagine, say, uh, chimps getting to the point that they would overpopulate and destroy the planet. Now you can, you can imagine something like the wolves in Yosemite suddenly developed health care and they no longer died off from disease and <clears throat> whenever any one of them got injured or suffered any kind of sickness from overpopulation, there wouldn't be any die off of the wolves, they'd just go to healthcare. Well, you could see what would happen. You'd say, that, you know, the, the caribou would die off, um, the, the elk and deer would just die off wherever there was a wolf, uh, and the wolves would go, uh, would make them go extinct. They would make their prey go extinct and then they would soon follow with, as a co-extinction after they've done that. So, you, so anybody looking at that would say, no, it's a really bad thing if wolves invented healthcare, it would be disastrous. But we don't apply the same standard to humans. So humans invented healthcare and we say, oh, that's awfully clever. And then humans invent, uh, say, nuclear technology and nuclear bombs, and then that's awfully clever. But we don't have the wisdom to not be clever. Now, the alien cortex is an amazing thing because it's clever enough to perceive what it's doing and look ahead. So it's clever enough to restrain itself. And that's what we could have been doing. That's all along. Uh, the, what's been in question is, can we restrain ourselves? And the answer now is no. I mean, the hunger for energy is increasing rapidly. China is building a coal-powered power station every week. Uh, things are deteriorating fast and the causes are actually accelerating where you think people would be starting to restrain themselves. So even if you look at things like Extinction Rebellion, they're not really restraining themselves. They don't want anything to change. They want to have their cake and eat it just like everybody else. They, they want to 
have all their creature comforts, they want civilization, they want health care, they want a huge population, um, but, and they want to save the whale. They, these are entirely incompatible asks. You can't demand that politicians provide jobs and job security and at the same time make uh, us carbon free, um, make our emissions carbon free by any time like 2025 or 2050. That's the, making carbon, making our whole society carbon emission free is equivalent to saying that we have to halt it. We have to halt civilization. But then you also want Medicare and you also want jobs and you also want to be fed and you also want the environment to be saved. And this is a too big a ask. All these, all these asks are conflicting. Nobody says what you have to sacrifice to get these things. And so what we're going to sacrifice is the human species. That's the default. Uh, because nobody wants to sacrifice every, anything. We will sacrifice everything. And it's too late now because of all the runaway effects to actually change it. So we can't make sacrifices now that will affect our future in any meaningful way. Um, we possibly can just extend our run a little bit, but then again, it'll probably be at the expense of quality of life and to just get a, a bit more quantity. Okay, so assuming you know all this and this is all old news to you, which it might be by the time uh, you watch this video, then I would like to present some of these questions and give my answers to them and have, uh, have you think about them. So was it inevitable? No. Now why the consensus will be that, yes, it's predestiny. It's the arrogance of the alien cortex. All well, the alien cortex was good. It wasn't at fault. Um, yeah, it's nothing we did. It's um, just built into the equation that civilization, you know, is, a, is if you touch that poison, you will die. And there's no way you can't touch that poison. Eventually, people are going to get civilized. I think that is quite wrong. Um, one of the reasons I think people will take that attitude that it's predestiny and there was nothing we could do about it is uh, because they are thinking in terms of, say, the Fermi paradox. Um, so the Fermi paradox, if you've never heard about it, it's, it's really asking the question, is why haven't we seen all these aliens? Why aren't there signals in outer space? Why can't we see radio traffic from all the alien civilizations that must be out there? Like Carl Sagan said, you know, in the billions and billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, uh, it stands to reason that there have to be a lot of civilizations. And so they set up SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, about 50 years ago, and for 50 years, SETI has found nothing, not a peep out of the universe that gives a hint that there are other civilizations that are sending out radio signals. Now, SETI itself was set up by a man called Drake, and the, he had an equation for how likely it would be uh, to find civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Drake equation is really about ten, has about 10 terms in it. So they're all terms like how many stars there are, how many of those stars have planets, and how many of those planets then can be assumed to evolve life, and how many of those can assume to evolve in an alien cortex and, and get civilization and start emitting these um, you know, radio signals, and then for how long. And so you multiply all those terms together and you get a probabilistic answer. And it's somewhere between, if you're very pessimistic, uh, probably about 20 civilizations in the entire Milky Way. But on the upside is probably about 50 million civilizations. Okay, so now what I think the mainstream is getting quite wrong about the Drake equation and then they'll catch up soon as soon as they become realists they will say oh well the, the Drake equation L was wrong so L is the time that they assume a civilization would be around to emit radio signals and and Drake assumed that it would be a thousand years to maybe a hundred million years 
And now, of course, we can see that, you know, it's really nothing like that amount of time. We've, we've only been uh, really emitting radio signals for, uh, you know, a little more than 100 years. If you, if you saw contact and um, Jodie Foster in contact, <clears throat> then you, were, my, or you may remember that the first television signals going out would probably be reaching Alpha Centauri around about now. And then those, those signals... Uh, we're really from the Olympic Games in 1936. So our emissary, if you remember from that movie, is Adolf Hitler basically opening the 1936 Games. Um, that's our emissary going out into space, according to L for our species. And now look, if you assume that extinction happens by 2050, uh, then really an L, L is, uh, is a little more than 100 years. So... 200 if you're lucky. So the idea that we'd be emitting radio signals for the next thousand years on the pessimistic side is crazy and soon people will realize that and they'd say okay well you know L is very short and that's why we don't hear of alien intelligence in the in the uh, in the Milky Way because uh, it's really a vanishingly small amount of time that you get to emit radio waves and if you do that you probably go extinct pretty much soon after that because of climate change and population growth so yeah just recently in the last month there's been something else that's come out and that's another equation another term in the drake equation and that's n so n is the number of stars that have exoplanets that are likely to support life and they used to think like Carl Sagan, that billions and billions, as he used to say. Billions, billions, trillions, trillion, million, 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 billion, four hundred billion suns. Billion, trillion, million, billion, trillions of orbiting snowballs. Billion, 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 trillions. Well, we found about 4,000 in the last few decades. And so everybody's very excited. Well, 4,000, and oh, that's very good going means we, we're on track with the Drake equation. Well, just this month it came out that, no, they've just found out that of those 4,000 exoplanets, only one of them has water. So only one of them out of that 4,000 is even remotely suitable for life. And so not only is L ludicrously optimistic, N is too. And we're fast in terms of the Fermi paradox coming to an inevitable conclusion that we may very well be absolutely alone in the Milky Way. Our consciousness and our civilization are very probably it, totally it, for conscious awareness of this level in the entire Milky Way. Who can say about the other galaxies, but the other galaxies are utterly uncontactable they're moving away faster than the speed of light we couldn't travel there uh, we couldn't send signals there so we are really limited in our sphere to the milky way and only to a part of it and to all extents and purposes uh, you can't have a conversation with any other life form um, because there probably aren't any so it means that life our life, human beings, were far, far more sacred than any one of the religions would have us believe. Especially the, the life-hating, horrid Christian and religions, religions of the book, Islam and all these Judeo-Christian horrors that devalue human life. Is There is no metaphysical God out there. Uh, the God you were looking for is us. It, we are the consciousness. Um, so... In the upside-down world that, um, that you live in, then it says, you know, in the Bible, in, in Genesis, uh, this is probably Moses writing Genesis, and he says that, um, you know, God created man in his own image. But of course, now you know the rule with your alien cortex, you're pretty much on safe ground if you just realize that it inverts everything. So it's really man created 
God in his own image. And of course that's obvious because if there's a man in the sky and he's got prehensile thumbs and he's got a penis and he has testicles um, and he has a son, um, obviously he's an anthropomorphiz uh, anthropomorphization of us and we invented him. There is no man in the sky and it's easily provable. Just show me where this man in the sky is and no one can. So yeah, obviously upside down. Um, so it really means that we are the consciousness that we were looking for in this metaphysical God. And it's a greater tragedy than people probably want to face, especially Christians, to say that uh, we cooked our own goose. And now that we're going extinct, that really is it. Um, you know, God's going dead with us and there's probably no other civilization on this planet. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, yeah, that's good. Well, you know, the, um, there's a, an impetus to say, um, yeah, the voluntary extinction movement. That it's time that humans went uh, extinct and there's this um, <coughs> uh, really this life-hating um, misanthropy that, yeah, well, you know, evolution will carry on and other life forms will come about. And now that's looking doubtful too. It may look like this is Venus and it may be a sterile planet. We might have made this planet absolutely sterile. So don't find comfort in that thought that maybe, you know, other forms of conscious life will carry on. They certainly, um, very primitive life forms and really on the edge of what you would even call life. Now, why this is relevant to the topic of is it inevitable was yes i think it the shamans were really discovered the solution to our new alien cortex as it was evolving what i can see happening uh, all along is that uh, the reason why these shamans are going into caves and meditating is they scientists I once asked somebody who knows a lot about uh, Sanskrit and Vedic uh, history and I asked him why are these people developing all this, the, the Mahabharata, this huge amount of text um, that I think it was only until about 1900 I think that the West caught up. There was this huge volume of all these philosophical texts and I asked him where did these things come from? What, do the, what did the people who wrote them think they were doing? And he said they were scientists. He said that people started to ask the question that what is life? What opened up my ears and eyes and made me conscious? And what's the point of it? And why do we die? What happens after our death? And the people, the general population asked, according to him, they asked this question and the sages went off to think about it and they went off meditating then he says they came back and they say in these forums in front of the people they debated it uh, so the sages one sage would come up with a theory and they would come they would put their competing theories to the crowd and the crowd would decide which one they liked best as an answer to what is life what is the meaning of it all why are we here what is consciousness uh, so they came up with this idea of the self and they came up with this idea of an afterlife. Uh, this is according to him, but I think there must be an element of truth in it. If you look at the, the shamans that are going into these caves to meditate, some of these archaeologists who've actually tracked down some of these cave paintings have had to go incredible distances in the dark slithering through this cave with expert equipment and torches now remember these people didn't even have uh, really much in the way of lights other than maybe tiny little lamps and this is 40,000 years ago and more um, these shamans are crawling through these cracks in the rocks deep 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 underground to then just do a single say red spot of ochre on a ceiling in a cave and you've got to ask why. Uh, they must have been tremendously brave. Just imagine this in terms of, of their worldview and cosmology. Uh, they're really going into the afterlife and they, in their terms. And 
Yeah, they must be more courageous than astronauts to, to go and do this delving into the psyche. And then to go over there in that deep and then in, in essence put yourself into a trance or uh, really have a psychedelic trip is, is it's, a, it's a tremendously brave, brave thing that they're doing. And I think somewhere along the, the way they realized that what the villain is and you can see it in the teachings, uh, the esoteric and religious teachings in Hinduism, all through shamanism and all the way even to, say, the witch doctors uh, the, the, um, in South Africa and in Africa. You can see in there what they're doing is they're healing the alien cortex. And what I mean by healing the alien cortex is they're bringing it to heal. They, and by that I mean bring it to heal like a dog. They yoking it. Um, so this is what I think is, is going on. Is an alien cortex runs simulations. It's a, a chess player. So it's strategizing. And it starts to look ahead. As soon as we start to evolve an alien cortex, it starts to you know, run future scenarios and ruminate on the past. And it's pretty soon before people start to ruminate about the ultimate question, and that's, <coughs> why do we die? All of us apparently die, um, and they have no good answer. So what happens to you after you die becomes a big question. So what is, why are we born? Why do we live this life and then die? And it becomes a question loaded with anxiety. Uh, it's really a thanatophobia. So um, this was kind of rediscovered in the 1970s by Ernest Becker. He wrote this book called uh, Denial of Death. And he said everything that you can see in terms of civilization and everything we've achieved, it's due to thanatophobia. It's due to denial of death. We're all trying to be immortal in our own little way. We're struggling to have our career. We're struggling to have our legacy. Um, even children, having children is a way of carrying on ourselves. We try and educate the next generation to be more like us. We want to do the great American novel so that we can live on for eternity. We want to be Shakespeare because Shakespeare is an immortal. But really is not. It's just the words of your alien cortex. So it's really your alien cortex is trying desperately not to die. It's trying to be immortal. And what the shamans are doing is teaching you techniques to handle that pathology. It is a pathology because they can see it's dangerous. Now, if they had succeeded in, and people had adopted techniques like the proper meditation, technique that I just told you about in the previous episode, then I think we wouldn't be going extinct. What seems to have happened is along the way, even things like meditation were taken out of their hands. You can see a split in meditation. So it branches off. There's the meditation I told you about that is proper meditation, which is about looking at the phosphines behind your eye and making a reinforcing feedback loop that creates these neuro uh, transmitting chemicals in your brain and activates them and you have sympathetic uh, reactions um, neuro reactions and reactions in your endocrine system and your hormone system all of these this chemistry set is going on based on this internal reflection so that's proper meditation now there's this bogus kind of meditation which is almost certainly the one you've learned it's commercial and it's spread all over the west it's spread because it was really kind of a Ponzi scheme. It reminds me very much of, of when the internet started. Now, when the internet started, there were all these courses. Nobody really knew what was going to happen with the internet. Nobody knew how to make money out of it, but they all thought it was the future and we all want to get into it and make money out of it. So all these courses popped up where you pay five grand and you get a course on how to make money on the internet. Well, if you were stupid enough to pay the five grand and went on the course, you found out that all the courses were the same. You set up a business where you give courses telling people how to make money out of the internet for five grand. That's how you make money on the internet. And that's what everybody did. And the same thing kind of happened with 
you know, Qigong and uh, with this phony meditation yoga and all of these, uh, all the BS now that, you know, mindfulness, mindfulness techniques and all this hokum uh, that, that we've now been saddled with. What happened was that people learned yoga, just basically made up stretch exercises. You could make up similar ones at home. At home. They'd just be, be just as effective. And then people that did yoga then decided, oh, they wanted some pocket money. So they decided they would teach yoga. And eventually they found the most money you can make is by giving yoga classes to teach people how to teach yoga classes. Almost the same as those classes from the internet. The way you make money out of yoga, take a class and you'll find out that it's giving classes on how to make money out of yoga. And that's kind of where we got to. So where did this all go wrong? What was the history that took the brakes off and stopped us getting wise, stopped us getting to a point where we weren't clever anymore? We were clever enough to restrain ourselves. We were clever enough to be wise like the shamans were. Uh, and those old sages. Well, if you look up the history of meditation, uh, you'll probably find that it's credited to go far back into prehistory, but obviously the history starts where historians can study it, and they can start to study it in written history. The written history of meditation starts in the Vedic literature. So if you look at the, say, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, it tells you how to meditate. And already it's phony. Already they're giving you this little spell, you know, this little hex. You say the word Om, which is a magic word, and this is a magic spell that's going to transform you, and it's going to make you wise, and it's, it's, it's not going to do anything of the sort. You're going to sit on your ass till it gets numb, um, basically just teaching yourself to be docile, just to be a castrated monk. Uh, and the whole ethos, if you look at the Vedic teaching, you can see that it's already corrupted. In India, you can still find the correct. It's called jhana. Jhana is um, a Sanskrit word which means reflection. Exactly what I was telling you about the feedback loop, like the camera filming its own monitor, which you do by looking at the phosphenes in front of your eyes. They self-reinforce, and then you get this, this feedback loop. And that's what it's all about. You still can find that meditation um, in India and it's it's taught in Tantra. Now Tantra is the older the older ethnic groups. So it's the older ethnic history of India. Indians of course and Hindu nationalists they hate this uh, line of, of of discussion that I'm going on because they want India to be homogeneous. So it's multicultural but very homogeneous and you know and then the muslims come in and ruin it all and that's what hindu nationalists want you to believe and so you know they they probably you know 100 million hindu nationalists that want that story to be the truth although clearly even if you just visit india you can see that it's a layer cake it's invasion after invasion and the oldest religions are preserved in the oldest ethnic cultures. So if you look at the really dark people, those are the ones doing Tantra. They have Kali. It's obviously the mother goddess. It's the ancient shamanic religion. Now, Hindus hate all that stuff. It's a huge embarrassment to them. And the fact that people out in the country still believe it is, um, you know, a source of injury to their national pride. So they kind of forced to incorporate it into Hinduism, and they, but they loathe it. They say that, you know, that's a backward primitive form of it, and you must do the higher form, which is the Vedic form, the, the form of meditation taught in the Vedas. But when you look at all these texts, already in the Vedas, they're full of hierarchies, they're full of duty and dharma, and they're full of things about obedience. they all these instructions. They're authoritarian to the hilt. They're all about the, the caste system and this class structure. It's even forbidden for certain castes to meditate. Only the Brahmins are really allowed to make, uh, to reach these higher uh, forms of knowledge, as they say, and get all this secret instruction. Um, <clears throat> and so it's very unegalitarian. It's almost like Jordan Peterson is right there on the covers telling you about obedience and duty and telling the truth and all these things that 
authoritarian, totalitarian governments love you to do. They want you not to covet so that they can have all the goodies. <clears throat> they want you not to question things because then basically you don't see through their scam. They want you to tell the truth because the worst thing you can do as a tax collector is have people lie on their tax forms. So these are trays, uh, obedience <clears throat> uh, in particular. Um, Nonviolence is another one that they've drilled into you because they're all things that they can yoke you <clears throat> and subjugate you, and that's clearly what they're doing in the Vedas. So who are these people doing this in the Vedas? Well, they describe themselves. The people telling you this authoritarian form of deviant meditation, which is really just trying to get the real meditation, which is sets you free and tells you to go and screw yourself authoritarian, <clears throat> they are telling you, no, no, we'll tell you meditation. It's like this, where you become a good wage slave. And that still continues today. You can still get mindfulness and meditation uh, training in the workplace. They, they love it for exactly the same reasons. So who were these people? They are the Aryans. They describe themselves as Aryans. Right. As soon as you say the word Aryan, you're in very deep political waters. So let's go and have a look at the Aryans because somewhere along the line, and it looks to me like it's the Aryans that do it, meditation gets subverted and you find this priesthood. This priesthood is asking for money. Just take a look at this verse where they completely give the, the game away in one of these Vedic writings. Jhana as Dharma. Meditation is duty. Practice righteousness, not unrighteousness. Speak the truth, not the untruth. Look at what is distant and not what is near at hand. And don't look at the man behind the curtain. Look at the highest, not at what is less than highest. The fire is meditation. The firewood is truthfulness. The offering is patience. The shruva spoon is modesty. The sacrificial cake is not causing injury to living beings. And the priestly fee is the arduous gift of safety to all creatures. So the Aryans, who were the Aryans? And why did they subvert the religion? Why did they subvert the knowledge? Why did they subvert the ancient shamanic teachings, which were really the wise teachings, and by wise I mean <clears throat> why, teaching people to be wise enough to restrain the alien cortex, to stop it asking these questions that Ernest Becker said in, in, in Denial of Death. Uh, the, Ernest Becker, by the way, let's just take a little detour to just look at Ernest Becker and the recent uh, rediscovery of, of this uh, shamanic tradition. So, psychologists uh, that really started in the school of Ernest Becker. Ernest Becker came right out from left field with this book, The Denial of Death, took the psychological world by storm and said that, yeah, everything is really due to <clears throat> denial of death. Uh, you probably don't realize it, but, you know, every time you get a call from your boss, you, you panic because you think, you know, oh, I'm going to get fired and if I... Uh, if I get fired, I won't have any money. If I don't have any money, I won't be able to get food. And if I don't have any food, I will die. And all of that goes, boom, straight through your reptilian brain in an instant as soon as the phone rings and you look at it and you think, oh, my God, it's my boss. So, <clears throat> yes, you, you are dominated. Ernest Becker was right. You are absolutely dominated by thanatophobia, by fear of death. And, <clears throat> you know, everything people are doing in, time, in terms of trying to make a name for themselves, trying to make a career, uh, literature, art, science, religion, they all denials that we have to die and there's nothing we can do about it. They're all pathetic denials and now they've got to a point where they've destroyed our planet so you can see that they're dangerous. Now Ernest Becker didn't have any solution to the problem. He saw the problem clearly but he couldn't see how. <clears throat> he didn't know much about uh, Eastern philosophy and he didn't know about shamanism. So he didn't know that there was a long tradition that's been recently in the historical record subverted. So he thought that there was no answer. He thought you can't, 
if you, the more you extend life, the more you make it a, a tragedy when life ends, so the more you increase people's anxiety about death. So he couldn't see a way out and he didn't realize, well, there is one. You just learn meditation and through meditation, you're, you will bring your alien cortex under control. Our alien cortex, on the other hand, exploded out of control. And I think if you want to see why, we need to go back to the Aryans.